in the government, both uh, in the Rajasthan cadre as well as in the government of India. Uh, Srinivas is the special secretary in the, in the government of India in the Department of Administrative Reforms and Public Grievances. He's also got additional charge of director general of the National Center for Good Governance, where he started, he really kick-started the agenda on good governance. So a lot of good work there. He's also India's representative on the International Institute of Administrative Sciences, which is a very prestigious uh, appointment. Srinivas is the recipient of the Digital India Award 2020 and 16. He's a, a, a noted author, he's published two books, He's widely published. He's worked, uh, served as India's advisor to the executive director of the IMF in Washington. He's delivered a number of orations. He's a very senior administrator, a respected academician, which is important for our audience today. And uh, how should I put it, an institutional builder par excellence. And uh, Srinivas, I first met Srinivas at the All India Institute where he reformed a very, very complex organization. He transformed the digital governance of AIMS as well. And hopefully he'll tell us a little bit about that today. Uh, he's going to talk today about transforming our future, public policy solutions for improving the quality of life, which is fundamental to all of us. So a very warm welcome, Srinivas, and over to you. Let me thank uh, Sri Parmeshwar Nayarji and also Sri Gopal Iyer for inviting me to the JSW School of Public Policy at the IIM Ahmedabad. It's indeed a great privilege to share a session with you, sir. And, uh, we've always looked up to you in service as a man who has scaled up India's uh, state capacities immensely. Uh, let me congratulate the Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad for operationalizing a center for public policy as an interdisciplinary forum and a platform for learning and research on public policy. And it is something that is a felt need. The uh, once we got to know, we've been interacting with them for the past few months uh, on how uh, various public policy initiatives can be better shared. And as uh, an officer who's heading one of the large public policy fora in the National Center for Good Governance, we find a lot of synergy with the Center for Public Policy at the IIM Ahmedabad. Uh, Mr. Parmeshwar Nair, uh, as I said, is a man who has successfully enhanced the state capacity for achieving saturation under the Swachh Bharat Mission Grameen within a short period of time. And enhancing state capacity represents a major challenge of uh, current day administration. How do we uh, transform under-resourced technologically obsolete government offices into digital institutions for addressing the realities of 21st century governance to meet the needs of citizens, to fight corruption, to bring greater transparency, to simplify citizens' needs. That represents a big challenge. And digital governance represents an important milestone of uh, the administrative state. Uh, when you look at uh, the four or five major uh, milestones in terms of uh, India's uh, governance reforms, you would find 1990 when India liberalized was one major milestone. Thereafter came the period between uh, 2000 to 2014 when there were a lot of regulatory institutions. And thereafter, what we are witnessing today is the rise of the digital state, wherein which uh, more and more institutions are adopting digital practices for example, financial inclusion has reached a scale uh, which we had not witnessed ever in our uh, recent past. And also direct benefits transfer has become a massive reality. We live in a world of extraordinary administrative complexity. And Mr. Parmeshwar Nair has seen how complex it can be, both from a national perspective in government of India and also serving as an international civil servant with the World Bank. And there are, there are huge uh, executive responsibilities. And no government can monitor agencies closely without digitalization. That is the reality of it. We need to digitalize institutions to take governance models forward. And uh, many institutions like the erstwhile planning commission were dedicated to working on legacy missions. How do you create a planned economy and did not have adequate flexibility. So we witnessed mission creep and also policy fatigue in these institutions, which necessitated setting up of new institutions like the Niti Aayog. 
And of course, we have the National Health Authority, which represents a major success story in, in the COVID platform, which has rallied industry, government, scientists to immunize more than 92 crore citizens with uh, the COVID vaccine. What we are also witnessing is an innovative state wherein which evidence-based policy making is being witnessed in a number of areas. And we have more and more ministries and departments which are publishing data. So we have the Department of Higher Education publishing data on universities. Uh, similarly, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs is publishing data on the Swatch Survection. We have the Niti Aayog, which publishes monthly data on the Aspirational Districts Program. There are new toolkits for change that are being developed and each of these data sets is being widely used for governance models. So uh, changing the way we work with government is an imperative need, is an imperative need. And uh, what I'll request is I have a PowerPoint presentation for you. I'll request uh, Sri Gopal Ayer to kindly share the PowerPoint presentation. We'll quickly go through it and then we can have a, a, a more prolonged question answer session. So this is what the prime minister said from uh, the ramparts of Red Fort uh, on how governance models can be transformed. And he said, in this decade of Amrit Kal, we will give priority to next generation reforms. We will ensure that all the facilities like service delivery should reach citizens up to the last mile. It should reach the last person seamlessly without hesitation or any kind of difficulty for the overall development of the country, unnecessary interference by the government and government processes in the lives of the people has to be ended. So we're looking at simplification of government processes. How do we improve service delivery? And how do we bring in next generation reforms? Each of these is possible with, by creating digital institutions. Next, please. Next slide, please. So uh, digital services for end-to-end -end service delivery is the motto uh, of the government and that is being done by establishing digital infrastructure as a core utility of every citizen so we need high-speed internet providing a unique digital identity access to common service centers so that governance and services are available on demand and we can create digitally empowered citizens next please the motto is maximum governance, minimum government. And uh, the leadership role in government is being seen by building to scale, building to last. And these are best witnessed by what I had described, the Swachh Bharat Mission Grameen, which was so ably led by Sri Parmeshwar Nayarji, as also by the, in terms of the Aadhaar platform, which was so ably led by Sri Ram Sevak Sharma, two major transformations that we have witnessed in our time. Next, please. The, my presentation is a very brief one, and uh, I'll broadly touch three, four aspects. One is creating digital institutions. The reforms that happen under Digital India, how do you increase efficiency in decision making? And then a concluding slide on the roadmap forward. Next, please. So let me share my experience of creating digital institutions in the period 2014 to 21. As the chairperson has rightly pointed out, next slide, please. As the chairperson has rightly pointed out, I was part of the Digital Aims success story, which was the first digital revolution in healthcare and won the Digital India Award of 2016. I was also part of digitization of a revenue board, which was called the first digital revolution of revenue courts of India. And then e-office won the Digital India Award of 2020. And in CP grants, we look at uh, the public grievance models and simplifying a citizen's journey across states, districts, and the national government. Next, please. So the digital aims was implemented in the period 2015 to 17, and it represents a remarkable model that simplified a complicated hospital journey for a patient by using the e-hospital software. So the operationalization of the e-hospital software was enabled by many institutions. There was the AIMS uh, uh, staff that were that had to create and operationalize new carders. The Ministry of Health and Family Welfare helped with the replication of this model on a pan-India basis. There was the Department of Information and uh, uh, Electronics, and uh, there was the UIDAI, which came in with Aadhaar seeding of uh, the unique health identification numbers. 
National Informatics Center, the Tata Consultancy Services, each of these agencies had an integral role in this. And uh, it enabled faster system of registration, interdepartmental linkages, unique health identification numbers, and in many ways was a precursor of the current national health mission. And it also envisaged digitization of all the management practices in creating India's first fully digital public hospital. So it has been replicated on a pan-India basis, represents a major success story, and as I said, a precursor to the national health mission that has been recently launched. Next, please. The digital Rajas Mandal was implemented in 2017-18, and uh, the Board of Revenue for Rajasthan was a technologically obsolete institution established in the British Raj, and uh, it had non-existent digitalization practices, and manual supervision of something like 400,000 files was an impossibility. So it replicated the e-court software in the revenue courts of Rajasthan, and it was called the revenue court management system software. There was synergy between the bench in the bar and across the state with thousands of court officers and advocates coming forward to adopt technology. So it enabled systemic efficiency, also improved predictability and consistency of court sittings, brought in tremendous transparency in terms of causeless judgments, decrees, which were provided at Gram Panchayat level. Next, please. The e-office was a very major enabling factor in the march for a digital central secretariat, and it enabled digital decision making, particularly in the pandemic period. And today we have more than 75 ministries of the government of India on e-office, more than 24 lakh files in the central secretariat, and the number of physical files have come down, freeing up office spaces. Uh, it also has built-in security features like virtual private networks to, to deputy secretary level, uh, digital signal signature certificates up to section officer level, and a massive capacity building of central secretariat officials was envisaged. Next, please. The CP grams represents another massive uh, portal, and uh, a citizen can approach the prime minister on the uh, public grievance portal using CP grams. And uh, we have national dashboards, particularly during the pandemic period. On a daily basis, you can see it. Last mile grievance officers, about 68,000 grievance officers have been delineated on the system. There's also been an integration of state portals, district portals in certain uh, in the Union Territory of Jammu Kashmir. Uh, uh, where CP grams has been integrated with the JKI grams up to district level. Uh, feedback call centers were operationalized during the pandemic period and uh, interaction with the citizens through virtual conferences was possible. Next, please. So let me come to the whole of government approach and how do you envisage a whole of government where we create more and more digital institutions. Next, please. A whole of government is the move from isolated silos to networks and digital platforms. It actually envisages transforming the way government works for the people. And this is the way in which government can meet the uh, demand on the part of the citizens for more personalized and accessible public services. Next, please. When you see the governance models across the world, what you see are uh, increasingly, governments are focusing on going digital. So we have, uh, be it from the United States to Australia, be it from Estonia to Japan or Singapore, everywhere, every country is going in for better digital services. Uh, they're looking at 21st century governance models as digital governance models, wherein which unique identification numbers like Aadhaar or the social security numbers of the United States are always there, which enable uh, better and more transparent uh, allocation of government resources. Next, please. So this is the major change was brought about by Digital India. Next, please. So Digital India is the campaign to transform India into a digitally empowered society and a knowledge economy. So we're building more and more high-speed digital highways to unite the nation. And uh, the objective is to ensure governance is transparent and government is open. Next, please. So what we have witnessed is a digital transformation of India's 
governance model. So we have Aadhaar cards, the number of e-transactions have crossed over 100 billion. There are several millions of uh, common service centers, and uh, we have a number of uh, government services being offered on the Umang platform. Jandhan accounts have crossed 31 million. We, can, we have a very large digital consumer base, and above all, the benefits of technology have been accepted by rural societies. Next, please. So this is the impact of technology progress in welfare state programs, particularly in terms of the direct benefits transfer, the goods and services tax, the Digital India Land Records program, uh, also labor payments under Narega, major change. Uh, in fact, each of these interventions has been a game changer. Next, please. So the direct benefits transfer represents a single big change, and uh, it has been possible because Aadhaar played a very key role, and beneficiary digitization eliminated duplication of beneficiaries. There was also data security that was introduced. Next, please. And the DBT works both in cash transfers, which we see in terms of social security and pensions, scholarships and fellowships. We also have uh, the two major subsidies of the food subsidy and the fertilizer subsidy operationalized through the DBT. So more than 314 central schemes have been onboarded onto the DBT Bharat portal. And we have interconnected e-governance social welfare delivery reforms. And the Umang app represents the single big success story providing over 1150 services on a single platform. Next, please. So DBT and fertilizers, when I joined service, we used to uh, speak of how fertilizer subsidy reforms would happen. And when I was private secretary to finance minister, the finance minister was very keen that uh, the subsidies should be more streamlined. And DBT in fertilizers enables streamlining of the subsidy in which the uh, farmer is identified on the basis of Aadhaar and fertilizers are sold by government at subsidized MRP and subsidy is directly paid to the manufacturer. But it's based on actual sales, so rather than on notional sales. So it has streamlined the subsidy rollout significantly. Next, please. The other major reform is the One Nation, One Ration Card. And currently over six crore beneficiaries and uh, you can draw rations from anywhere. And uh, once you have uh, uh, your and biometric authentication and it can be authenticated on an, uh, a POS machine. So you can walk into any fair price shop across India and over 26 states are currently on one nation, one ration card. And it represented a major reform in terms of the public distribution system sub subsidy distribution. Next, please. The passport seva kendra, in fact, every time I visit a passport office, I'm quite amazed to see the quantum of change. A secure digital outflow has streamlined India's passport systems. And it's a very pleasant experience now to go to a passport office rather than visit crowded offices uh, where physical handling of paper was there. Uh, now, police verification has been streamlined. You can submit your application in any of the 488 parliamentary constituencies. There's also over 190 missions. And basically, you get a passport within a prescribed time limit. No wonder it has been a huge success with two pro online hits per day. Next, please. Government e-marketplace represents another big change in terms of procurement reform. In terms of the buyer-seller interface, uh, there was a lot of colorable exercise of authority, and the government e-marketplace actually eliminated that kind of a buyer-seller interface. And it also uh, mandated under the general financial rules that uh, governments will procure goods and services on the GEM portal. So it's uh, not, it was backed up by adequate uh, 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 procedural powers under the general financial rules to procurement officers to operationalize the GEM portal. Next, please. So these are some of the innovations. And I spoke of an innovation state in digital governance. We see digital land. We see financial inclusion in the India Post, e-pensions, where Jeevan Praman certificates are being given, the Umang app where more than uh, 1150 services are being provided on a single platform. Next, please. So 
the digital innovations that are being done are evaluated on a national e-services delivery assessment. So we are evaluating the quality of e-governance services. And I'll share with you the results of the NESDA 2019 survey. Next, please. In which over 980 services were studied on accessibility, content availability, ease of use, information security, end service delivery, integrated service delivery, and status and request tracking. These were the parameters of the study. Next, please. And uh, the results threw up uh, Kerala as India's uh, most digitally empowered state, and uh, Himachal Pradesh in the northeast and hill states emerged as India's most uh, digitally empowered state in integrated portals. Next, please. In terms of service portals, we found Haryana and Rajasthan's portals were doing very well. In the northeast, the Nagaland portal was doing extremely well. Next, please. In terms of the central ministries, we found the finance ministry's uh, CBDT portal where we file our tax returns, the HRD ministries, the uh, Swayam portal was doing well, the labor and employment uh, ministries, EPFO portal was doing well. In terms of uh, health and family welfare, also a lot of service portals, uh, the integrated services were being offered. Next, please. How, how is uh, technology being used to increase efficiency in decision making? Next, please. One of the big things technology has brought forth is it has enabled delayering in terms of the number of channels in which uh, files have to be submitted. Today, the number of channels have come down to three or four, as compared to when you look at what Appleby studied uh, and submitted the survey of public administration in 1953, he found as many as 53 channels, 30 to 42 channels in which a receipt was processed. So there's been massive delaying, flatter organizations have become possible. Operationalization of the e-office version 7.0 across the central sector Secretariat has enabled interministerial transfer of files, monitoring dashboards with regard to pendency, and identifying where uh, the gaps were in terms of decision making. Uh, the digitalization of the central registration units has eliminated the massive handling of dark and operationalization of a desk officer system wherein which a single officer will deal with the subject. For example, the Ministry of External Affairs currently operates nearly 264 desk officers. So dealing with various subjects uh, at their own level, it brings in huge systemic efficiency. Next, please. So the way forward, uh, next, please. So the way forward represents integrated service delivery, adoption of standards, and embracing new technology, and also e-literacy. The citizens need to be literate to handle this kind of digital technology and creating a digitally inclusive ecosystem. This kind of transformation in India's uh, welfare state programs would not have been possible, but for large societies accepting change. And today when we see millions of Indian citizens benefiting from these transformative policies, what we can say is that the digital state or the innovation state is very much here to stay. Next please. So this is how New India looks. It is an amalgamation of a number of uh, digital platforms, Bharatnet, Etal, eSign, DigiLocker, MyGov, a whole range of digital platforms which are functional have been created. Next, please. Next slide, please. So a one-stop portal is a great step forward to establishing a whole of government. The portal per se doesn't guarantee an outcome, but it has to be backed by process re-engineering across uh, the governance systems. And there exists substantial benefits for both government and citizens from adopting a whole of government approach as I've uh, described. Next, please. So the subject is transforming our future. How do we improve the quality of life? And to improve the big issues of our times, we need to find solutions that matter. And one of the big solutions that matter is digital institutions. And they alone are the best way to improve the future quality of our life. And we need to focus on simplifying a citizen's journey with government. So this is the PowerPoint presentation I thought I should share with IAM Ahmedabad on this occasion. Uh, I think the, the next slide. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Back to you, sir.
Thank you, Srinivas. Fascinating presentation. Incredible array you have presented, taking us through the you know the entire gamut of the reforms you're bringing about uh, through your department, but you know even in other spheres, all the spheres you've been associated with, both in terms of digital governance, but also in terms of improving service delivery. And I like the way you put it: improving the quality of the citizens' engagement with government. I think that comes across in all these programs which are now being operationalized. I think it's leading to quite a transformative reform process. So fascinating presentation. I don't know how you covered it so quickly, but it was, it was tremendous. I have a few questions myself, but I'd rather we'll get some from the audience. But let me just kick it off, Srinivas, with one question. You know, when you started out reforming uh, and digitalizing the governance of AIMS, right? We all know, uh, you know, just to be, you know, doctors, are, you know, they've got very strong opinions. They're very well connected. They're all prima donnas. And in an institution like AIMS, which is the premier medical teaching hospital in India, what were the challenges you encountered in bringing about these reforms? Just can you share some of them with us? It must have been, it couldn't have been easy. No, it was not easy at all. It was it actually took huge amount of uh... Uh, persuasion and number of uh, meetings for consensus building. Uh, I do recall when we first floated it, uh, th there was very little in terms of uh, acceptability on streamlining processes. And uh, it took huge number of meetings. In fact, we would start meetings at eight o'clock in the morning, sometimes at 7.30 in the morning, because 9 a.m. the OPDs would commence. And uh, Professor V.K. Paul came forward first to take up digitization of uh, the uh, pediatric department and uh, also we had professor sk sharma who said medicine department is getting a huge number of patients and uh, this is where uh, a small pilot should be taken up so the digital aims project actually started with uh, two departments out of 65 and then uh, in fact, when I first time when we went to UIDAI, I and Professor Deepak Akarwal, we only had seven photographs of how crowded the AIMS looked. How do we seed the unique health identification with Aadhaar? So they had to depute teams. And uh, I've documented the study in a number of papers as to how difficult it was. And even when you create functional digital systems, how difficult it is to translate it into the field. Because the first day we tried to um, uh, operationalize the new uh, system of an OPD that was transformed, we found it very difficult to have people standing in lines to go to a patient registration center, then go to the waiting spaces. And uh, it required a huge orientation, not only on part of uh, the uh, teaching faculty and the clinical faculty, the nurses, but also in terms of the patients. And the patients needed to be told that this is the changed model where your wait times will come down significantly. And uh, what we found was that once the new models and processes were put in place, uh, the 3 a.m. queues at AIMS actually disappeared. And uh, the queues would start at eight o'clock. Everything became far more orderly by nine o'clock, OPDs would commence. And uh, the www.ors.gov.in platform today is operationalized in more than 490 hospitals across India and has benefited over three crore Indians. So it's a huge uh, systemic reform that uh, a small uh, digital institution made. No, no, fascinating, Srinivas. I, I can imagine the difficulties of sort of bringing about that kind of change. Because I think many of our uh, colleagues at the Institute at Ahmedabad, you know, uh, all the, the political economy issues which go into each one of these initiatives, how they have got to be socialized and grounded, very major challenges. I mean, those are the challenges of scaling up initiatives. I just have one more uh, uh, quick question and then you know, maybe Gopal, Namrata, and all, there are lots of people, and it's also on the YouTube channel, and their questions will be coming in. You know, you spoke about the citizens' interface with government. And I recall a book, you know, way back in of my vintage, a book called A Passion for Excellence, where the chairman of the Scandinavian air system, the airlines, he said, listen, every passenger who meets a, a sales agent or a ticketing agent, that exchange with that person is the exchange with the airline. That is the airline for them. And he called it a moment of truth. And that you know, decides or determines the citizens or the consumers 
opinion of the organization. So as you said, you know, the prime minister is, trying, uh, is keen on eliminating sort of, uh, you know, too much of human contact between, you know, the, the citizen and the, the lower government functionary, if you like. How far have we progressed on this and what is the sort of ultimate aim on this in terms of key programs? I, th I think uh, you. Uh, 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 this is a uh, question actually that you can best answer yourself as to how how did you bring this massive transformation and scaling up of state capacity in the Swachh Bharat Mission Grameen? And after many, uh, we've been implementing this program for many decades, and yet uh, in terms of scaling up or adoption by rural societies, it was a program that was very difficult because behavioral changes were required and. Uh, I think leadership makes a huge amount of change and your leadership when dealing with uh, the Swachh Bharat mission uh, had ensured that uh, there was a massive scalability of the program. And uh, today what we're looking at is scalability in many other programs. And uh, when uh, the prime minister spoke about uh, saturation of government programs from the ramparts of Red Fort, I think uh, it needs uh, many other programs which would be scaled up in the coming days. Uh, and that, that is what uh, it is possible when large uh, rural communities and societies accept change as a felt need. So that, that, that is, uh, but I, I'd like to hear from you, how did you achieve this kind of massive scaling up within a short period of time? No, that, uh, uh, thanks, Srinivas. As you said, you know, th this prime minister made it very clear that he wanted, you know, delivery on the ground, and you know, and it needed to be monitored. So, in the Swachh Bharat mission, as you mentioned, it became critical to get that village community, you know, supervised by the Gram Panchay, to understand the importance of the entire village becoming open defecation free, and it was no longer a question of individual households having latrines. So it became an accountability of that society of the village community, and that needed to be triggered. So it was a combination of getting, you know, swachagrahis, grassroots functionaries, village motivators, uh, motivating the sarpans, doing a lot of training, and really trying to make it a jan andolan, a people's movement, as you've been mentioning. Not easy at all. And, you know, when we started out, we, we had, the four S's were our challenges. Scale, speed, uh, stigma, you know, having a talk, and then sustainability. So these were major challenges, and we sort of learned as we went along. But uh, you know, your state, Rajasthan, was one of the pioneers in this. I remember you were there as well. You were, uh, you know, giving the guidance from the Institute of Public Administration. So I think we learned from a few districts, and just as you have developed an index comparing the digital performance of government of India and states a little bit of friendly competition helped as well between states. But the bottom line was getting school kids, school teachers, the lower level functionaries, the Anganwadi workers, and getting them all excited about the program and owning it so that there was, you know, it would be sustained. So not easy at all. Still many challenges, you know, in sustaining the program. But I think that the mission mode which this prime minister has brought about in many of the programs, that became very, very important. And, uh, you know, with the work you're doing now, Srinivas, fascinating how you're integrating public grievances at the state level with the national level, with CP Gram. Because this is something which we know the PM reviews regularly you know, during Pragati. And uh, it's a big challenge for you and your department. You guys are sort of coordinating this. That's been a fascinating experience in terms of the effective disposal, not just a paper from here to there, but actually disposing of and addressing or redressing the grievances of the public. Maybe a thought, quick thought on that. And I think some questions are coming in, but let me first share this question. Uh, There's a question from Abhishek Chauhan. How is government planning to improve digital literacy so that you not only have more efficiency, but also have effectiveness, which has the inclusivity factor? Uh, let me uh, take up both questions. In fact, uh, 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 there, is, there are always going to be internet rich and internet poor citizens. And uh, inclusivity is a big challenge. And digital literacy is currently being practiced through the uh, CSCs, the common service centers, where more and more services are available online. So if you see a, 
a village economy today. In fact, I, I traveled through the length and breadth of Rajasthan and uh, over 8,000 kilometers. And I found Rajasthan's villages had changed enormously from when I had last seen them. There were digital merchants that were seen. There were e-mitra. There were banking correspondents who, who dominated the rural countryside. And uh, more and more services uh, were being made available on the e-mitra plus platform. If you go to a gram panchayat, you found uh, so much of digital equipment that was there. Everybody had a, had a, an Aadhaar card. Everybody had a bank account and financial inclusion. So it was quite massive in terms of the transformation of India's rural societies. In terms of public grievances, the citizen can write sitting in any part of the country directly to the prime minister, and that grievance can be mapped to the last mile. In fact, uh, there may be six or seven levels through which uh, the grievance that a citizen has filed is routed through. For example, if it is mm, sent to the Ministry of External Affairs in terms of an evacuation request, or if it is sent to the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare for a healthcare emergency, it goes through multiple levels and still it is monitored on a digital platform. Today, the number of citizens who interact with government on the CPGRAMS portal is nearly 25 lakhs. And when you compare it with what we were handling, say, seven years ago, we were handling about two to three lakh grievances a year. In terms of sheer scaling up of handling public grievances, it has made a massive change. The integration of state portals and the reverse integration of state portals has meant that those grievances which come on the uh, CPGRAMS portal can be sent directly in an online manner to the states and the states can route their grievances directly to uh, the government of India where uh, the union ministries have to handle those grievances. The integration of district grievances, particularly in the union territory of Jammu Kashmir, has made JKI grams a very successful initiative in that, that uh, more than 20,000 grievance officers were mapped on the system. The same way in the government of India, we used to have about 10,000 officers mapped on the CPGRAMS portal. Today, we have about 70,000 officers mapped on the portal. So the grievance can reach the last mile, saving huge amount of time, and it can be redressed well within uh, the prescribed time. Time limits. In fact, I notice many grievances are addressed within 15 days of time. In terms of COVID uh, pandemic days, uh, grievances were addressed as low as three days. So it was a huge transformational change in the way government interacted with citizens under the uh, centralized public grievance redressal mechanism. Thanks, Srinivas. Uh, questions are coming in now. But let me take two more. One is uh, there's uh, a, you know appreciation by Charu Malhotra of the CSCs, the common service centers, which have really increased sort of you know public digital literacy. So uh, you know so there's an appreciation of that. If you want to shed some light on how they work, my batchmate Dinesh Kyagi uh, is sort of handling that. And then there's a, a question from Krishna Bhaskar. If this is Krishna, my batchmate Bhaskar's son, so he's a you know young IAS officer. You probably know him well, outstanding officer. He's raising an interesting question that digitalization of land records seems to be much more meeting with more resistance than digitalization of medical records. So is that your experience as well in any ways to get around this problem? And there are a couple more questions. We'll take them later. The digital land records modernization program started prior to my joining service, and it's 33 years now, or maybe 35 years since its inception. And uh, it is still work in progress in terms of creating legacy records. Uh, one of the big changes that the government of Telangana did, and uh, I was quite impressed with it, was linking registration with uh, the mutation process. Often we found that registration processes are uh, digitally available and uh, the mutation process, uh, which is done by the village patwari, has to be a manual process and then it is entered into a digital record. This kind of automatic linkage was a significant step forward. I was also very impressed by what I saw with the uh, government of Uttar Pradesh, the digital land program represented a significant scaling up and today there are more than two crore hits per day. Uh, it is important to have digital land records so that uh, land holdings are uh, clearly demarcated. And this is one area where a lot of push is necessary. Uh, the resistance to 
a change is quite significant. In fact, uh, when I tried to digitize the Board of Revenue, I found uh, there was massive resistance. The members opposed it, the registrar opposed it, the advocates opposed it, and one had to really put forth personal credibility to say that this is something that is in the interest of the state and it has to be taken forward. So today when young Krishna says uh, that he is willing to take it forward and he's a huge innovator in terms of uh, digital governance models, um, this is one area where he can significantly take it forward and uh, can be a torch bearer to ensuring timely closure of the digital land records program in the coming years. Thanks, Srinivas. There's a question on, uh, so uh, Dr. Charu Malhotra again on PMG Disha. She's saying that, uh, you know, it was supposed to cover six crore persons, one member from every eligible household across all gram panchayats in states, and to make them digitally literate. What is the present status during COVID? And the second question is, with, you know, so much of uh, time and public resources being spent on digitalization across government, across different governments, there's still a lot of resistance. And many people are still preferring a time-tested manual system. So are there any ways to overcome this kind of resistance? Yes, the, the only way, as Professor Charu knows, is uh, greater consensus building. Once technology is accepted by rural societies, the scaling up is, uh, can be very significant. And, uh, but till that time when technology is uh, accepted by the citizens at large, consensus building efforts have to be made. And uh, uh, she has documented uh, and spoken on many fora with regard to how digital institutions can be operationalized. And the best way is consensus building. And uh, you need many more meetings to, for process re-engineering. The problem is not uh, in terms of the digital platforms. The, process, the, the challenges lie in how processes will be re-engineered and what, is, what comes first and how do we simplify each of these multiple processes. So as I said, uh, in terms of uh, simplifying the CP grams, we found we needed to map more officers. In terms of uh, integration with state portals was the next step. Integration of district portals was the next step. And ensuring there was uh, reverse integration was the next step and uh, capacity building of each of the grievance officers by giving them login IDs, passwords, and uh, closure of dormant accounts. It was huge process re-engineering that went in. And uh, the citizens also had to be uh, told through uh, uh, the common service centers and uh, the other digital platforms, the sensitization in terms of how best to use this new technology so that the grievance reaches the last mile that had to be ensured. So it's an extremely, uh, it's not easy. Process re-engineering is where a lot of time and effort and also leadership skills are required in case digital institutions are to be built uh, across the length and breadth of India. Central government digitalization program is well on track. I think the challenges lie in digitalization of states and uh, even more challenges and district level. So this would be the next step in terms of uh, digital reforms. How do we put more and more institutions at state level on digital platforms? You're right, Srinivas. In fact, that's the point which uh, Renu Sharma is making is, you know, the how do you sort of get digitalization at the state level? And she's giving the example of JNK in particular, uh, you know, the challenge of digital inclusiveness through states and some states will be more challenging than others. And there's a question from Namrata, who's the chairperson of the uh, Institute of Public Policy. How is the government working towards improving the regulation of digitalized information and digital services? And then dealing with issues like data privacy, quality, security, et cetera. So is there any thinking or any movement on those lines? Yes, I think it's a very important question because the rise of a digital state would also necessitate the rise of a regulatory state in terms of ensuring uh, digital privacy. So particularly in terms of fintech. And uh, when we see fintech uh, grow at this pace, it's, it's an unbelievable speed with which uh, uh, financial technology has grown. And uh, the, 
the sheer uh, length and breadth of the fintech coverage, we need strong regulatory governance models. And uh, I, I see that impact uh, being seen in terms of the rise of a regulatory state, in terms of protecting data privacy, in terms of ensuring security of transactions, in terms of ensuring two-factor, multi-factor authentications when you use your uh, ATM cards or debit cards or even logging into government websites. So uh, these are the areas where uh, systemic improvements have been made to ensure that uh, the privacy of citizens is totally protected and uh, nothing is more better demonstrated than the use of uh, security features, the improved security features that we are witnessing in terms of our fintech uh, platforms. Thanks, Srinivas. Um, there was another, uh, you know, a question which was sort of, uh, I think you have referred to it a bit, which, which came in, I think it was one of the earlier questions, on the challenge of, again, it's the, it's the same issue of how do you sort of get this down to the lowest level, right? And uh, I know there's the program which uh, Telecom is leading of connecting every single gram panchayat through cable. Uh, is that... Uh, still going on, uh, has it, have they achieved? I remember Aruna was working on that when she was Secretary Telecom. Has, have all the panchayats been covered just in terms of providing access to high-speed internet? Yes, so that, that program is still on. The Universal Service Obligation Fund is used to develop India's digital highways and uh, ensure that the last mile connectivity to villages is being provided. So that program very much remains in place. And that is actually the flagship program to take high-speed internet to India's uh, village communities. Then there's a question from Gopal uh, Srinivas. He's saying there's a bit of disruption uh, coming up in uh, in the insert tech space globally. And he's saying with Ayushman Bharat now coming in, how can government work with the private sector and with private participants to ensure faster adoption states and down to taluks or blocks? Is there a role for the private sector? Yes, uh, very much, very much a role for the private sector because that's where regulatory administration and regulatory governance models are coming in. Uh, what we do see in terms of uh, the health insurance sector is that there is a number of uh, third party uh, insurance providers who have been performing very well. Star Insurance is there. There's also ICIC Lombard. A number of private players have uh, stepped in uh, into the health insurance sector who are participating in major flagship programs. Now, my association with uh, health sector insurance was uh, in the initial stages when I was serving as uh, uh, Secretary Family Welfare and Mission Director of the NRHM. And at that time, one of the most successful models was the Arogya history model of uh, government of Andhra Pradesh. And uh, that was seamlessly functioning at that point of time. And that was replicated in Rajasthan as the Bhamasha model of financial inclusion and healthcare. So that was my experience of watching health insurance, wherein which a number of uh, third party insurance providers had come in. And uh, I found that they had seamlessly integrated into the system and the regulatory models were quite uh, well operationalized. I'm sure the Ayushman Bharat scheme, which the National Health Mission is current, National Health Authority is currently regulating, um, is adequately backed up by software. In fact, I did see one or two presentations of theirs, uh, and uh, I was very impressed with the kind of models that they had built up in terms of uh, sheer outreach to uh, several hundreds of thousands of uh, citizens across India in terms of healthcare for uh, insurance facilities. So Srinivas, this is a question, a very interesting one from Rajiv Ranjan, which is right up your street. So given the tight timeline to the SDGs, right? Only less than nine years left and recognizing the complex nature of the problems in the 21st century, in terms of the education of future civil servants, how can this be made more transdisciplinary as well as their selection and nurturing process, how can this be streamlined so that you know we can uh, India can become the Vishwa Guru as Honorable PM is talking about? How can we lead in this regard? What are all the good stuff you're doing in your current role, directly involved with administrative reforms, the Civil Services Day, and the 
working with the LBSNA and Department of Personnel on sort of, you know, this whole karma yogi concept. How's that going? Uh, the the uh, challenge of meeting the sustainable development goals remains immense, and uh, you would know it working in the World Bank, monitoring the W, uh, the monitoring the SDG targets and the pace at which we are progressing. Uh, when I see the big challenge is how, how will several static, uh, technologically obsolete government institutions uh, take the challenge forward of uh, implementing a very, very ambitious SDG agenda, which requires huge amount of scaling up and uh, scaling up in terms of every program, poverty eradication, scaling up in terms of uh, say sanitation, uh, across the board, health and wellness centers, massive scaling up is required, which will require handling of huge data, use of artificial intelligence, more and more algorithms being used and uh, machine learning being used. Uh, it is only possible when uh, digital institutions uh, come into play. And uh, in terms of transforming our uh, state into a highly scaled up model, uh, the only way forward is to have more and more digitization. That is increasingly what I see as the uh, roadmap, roadmap ahead. And uh, for that, uh, greater digital inclusiveness, uh, the efforts for having an India enterprise architecture are the roadmaps forward. You have successfully demonstrated that uh, a mega national level data set monitoring is possible in case uh, of the Swachh Bharat mission. And uh, I'm sure you would have identified to a very disaggregated analysis at uh, the national level, which are the areas where greater emphasis would be necessary and which are the areas where uh, uh, the performance levels are very strong. Today, that kind of disaggregated data sets are available across 49 parameters in the aspirational districts program. And the ADP program actually is the one that will, uh, with its very, very minute analysis in terms of health indicators, nutrition indicators, um, Anganwadi centers performance in terms of agriculture performance, in terms of uh, financial inclusion, uh, monitoring across multiple indicators makes it very, very uh, comprehensive for policy interventions. So if you're looking at, say, Kokrajhar district, or you're looking at uh, Sirisilla district or Rajasthan's Karoli district, how is each of these districts performing at a disaggregated level can be seen from Delhi itself. And then policy interventions can be prescribed. So I'm sure the India's rush towards the SDGs can be expedited by strong digital institutions. No, yeah, I think you're spot on, Srinivas. And you know, the more decentralized they get, the better. I think as it is, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, uh, you know, we've got some of the best, I mean, district administrators ask, you know, Kada at that level is outstanding, right? I think it's the best in the world. And in terms of general district administration, multidisciplinary intersectoral development work, you know, it's youngsters like Krishna Bhaskar and Co, which make the system run, right? You know, it's that old saying which in the UP cardio, we use PM, CM, DM. You know, that's the kind of access which is, you know, is, is the formula for success. But unless, as you said, unless you can decentralize a digitalization, take it down to the grassroots, you won't achieve the SDGs. Couple more questions, Srinivas. One is from Namrata. What is, what is your thinking putting on, uh, in looking into your crystal ball? What is the next big digital wave that will change citizen life for the better. And a related question from Mubarak Ali is on disruption. Uh, you know, it's happening all over the world at an increasing rate. Uh, how do you see, do you have any advice for the disruptors of the country? Well, you know, the next big wave is how do you improve service delivery? And that uh, is what was pointed out in my first slide when I uh, presented uh, what the Prime Minister said from the ramparts of Red Fort. In that, that uh, the next big wave is uh, next gen uh, reforms for improving service delivery. And uh, more and more services would be brought on digital platforms and integrated service portals would be created. So. Today we have 1150, perhaps say five years from now, we could be looking at over 5,000 services which are being, uh, which are available on a digital platform with 
uh, a huge amount of uh, data interoperability. So that, that is the big next wave that is coming. And a uh, lot of emerging technologies are there. There's so many unicorns that are successful. So I think the next uh, big change that I see is, of course, fintech uh, growing more and more uh, sophisticated because that represents a single big change. Uh, every time I see India Post, the way it has been transformed, it, it is massive. Here was a department which was delivering letters at uh, every doorstep and today the uh, the postman has become a banking correspondent uh, handling huge amount of financial transactions and india post has become a, a payment bank uh, which is formally recognized by the reserve bank of india you know so it, it is a massive uh, transformation that department it shows that a department if it show, has the resolve and resilience can transform itself into a modern day digital institution so i think that transformation represents uh, a massive change uh, because it's felt across the length and breadth of India. The same with passport seva kendras, I must say. The way passport seva kendras have passport offices have transformed themselves into new digital institutions is indeed a matter of great pride for the nation. Srinivas, has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, I really don't want to cut it short because questions are still coming in. But I've got a selfish reason, you know, I'm, I, as I mentioned, I'm sitting here in Dakar, Senegal. I got in here a few hours back from Washington. So I have a meeting with the Minister for Water. The traffic is a little crazy here. It's going to take me an hour to get there. So uh, should we just continue and Namrata will continue moderating? Uh, how, how do you want to do this? You have the time because there are lots of questions. You can continue for a while. Uh, well, think, whatever, whatever the... That would be great. So Namrata, uh, uh, why don't, if you can kindly take over, and Amrita is the chairperson of the institute, and uh, she's got a couple more questions of her own. But uh, if you want to continue for a few more minutes, I, I really don't want to stop it. I would like to stay on, but I've got to run. Will but you thank you so much on my behalf, uh, Srinivas. Fascinating discussion. We've got to get you to talk to a number of other audiences as well. It's been a, a real pleasure interacting with you and look forward to meeting you in November in Delhi. Thank you so much. Thank I'll, you. I'll sign off here. Thank Bye. You. Thank you, Param. Thank you so much. Hello, Mr. Srinivas. Um, so just taking over from Param, uh, he was doing a fantastic job. So I hope I can live up to the standards that he's already set. So I'm just looking through if there are any more uh, questions. I guess some related questions uh, which were already asked before, uh, which is about um, the underutilization of digital uh, technology. So there was a question which was a, a similar question that was asked early on as well. Uh, how do we get around the issue of underutilization of digital technologies? The, the challenge is bringing in more and more people into, into the digital fold. And digital literacy represents an enormous challenge. And uh, that is what has to be pursued. The way forward is more and more digital literacy. I operationalized uh, the CSCs for improved digital literacy. Uh, and it's not only the uh, rural communities. We also need digital literacy within the government institutions where employees have to be made digitally literate. Many of us have joined service uh, 30, 35 years ago. And um, to keep pace, uh, one has to unlearn the old skills and learn the new skills. So every time I see a new version of e-office, I still have to go back and figure out uh, how the dashboards work, how my login IDs and, passport and passwords work, how do I use that huge quantum of data to decipher and reach at uh, policy making changes. So uh, it is not only un, uh, a, a concept of digital literacy at, uh, for the society at large, but also for those of us working within government, where many of us have to unlearn our old habits of writing physical files and learn to write on uh, electronic files. Uh, to understand how files move across ministries. These are things that uh, we need to figure out uh, on, as we progress. Indeed, indeed. I think uh, you know, that, that's going to be a very big step uh, that is necessary, which is to create that level of digital uh, literacy. 
And maybe it goes back to a lot of other fundamental questions around how we are actually educating and training um, our the students and, and our professionals. Uh, so I'm just checking again if there are uh, any more questions that I might have missed. So, so far we seem to have covered uh, covered all the questions that have come in. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you if you wish, we can wrap up the talk here uh, because I don't see any further questions coming in. I so there is just close. we can close. Mm -hmm. uh, let me thank I am Ahmedabad. It's my first interaction with you on an official forum. I'm glad that you started the Center for Public Policy because uh, it, it is very important. Uh, for uh, practicing administrators to learn from uh, uh, administrative theorists and uh, exchange of uh, knowledge and information from theory to practice represents a huge uh, uh, benefits for book, uh, mutual, it has significant mutual benefits. Uh, the National Center for Good Governance has been trying similar platforms. In fact, we've organized 17 webinars in which we've invited a huge number of uh, academicians and uh, thinkers to come and share how technology can be best used for uh, improving public policy. And uh, I found uh, there, is, there are a number of areas where we have benefited from our interaction with uh, practicing academicians and uh, by creating this uh, fora between academia and uh, practicing administrators, we found that there are significant benefits which we can take forward into policy making realm. So let me thank you for extending me this invite today. And I wish the Center for Public Policy all success. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to read out one final uh, question and uh, comment that has come in. Uh, it's asking about how is the government planning um, to reach the last mile in terms of generating new kinds of employment in villages, which will then result in an increased level of digital literacy. So what are the plans in terms of uh, coming up with initiatives such that it generates um, employment as well as increases digital literacy in villages? The, uh, the nation represents uh, a massive digital consumer database, and it has so many digital opportunities, uh, jobs which we never thought uh, existed. When we tried the digital aims model, we found that uh, we had to create several new cadres. There was uh, uh, the national, uh, the nursing informatics service had to be created. We had to create patient care coordinators. We had to create so many uh, new posts of data entry operators. So these were posts that were created and I do see uh, Matilda Robin in the group and uh, she was one the chief of the NIS uh, ensuring that uh, the doctor's diaries were properly streamlined with the patient requests. So uh, in terms of uh, digital institutions, uh, the number of new job opportunities that uh, would be available would be higher than what they would be in a non-digital institution stage. That is something that uh, I have seen. A flourishing digital technology innovation can create several hundreds and thousands of new jobs. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, response to the question. And uh, it has been our pleasure. I think it has been a fantastic uh, session. Uh, and uh, I myself, I think I learned about so many things happening uh, in the sphere of digital transformation. And of course, the School of Public Policy is there, but the, the Institute has also created some specialized centers, particularly the Center for Digital Transformation, that's what it is called. So we see uh, more such opportunities where we could interact and work with your uh, department. So we are very much looking forward uh, for further collaboration. Thank you once again uh, for this very, very insightful session. Uh, and on behalf of the JSW School of Public Policy and the Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad, uh, I thank you uh, and your, you know, and your department for, uh, you know, allowing us this valuable time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.